I want to give an update on our work trying to couple single electron spins using microwave frequency photons. And uh, this has been a project that's been underway. We started working on this, you know, 2010, 2011, and have uh, evolved in terms of materials and have some nice breakthroughs lately uh, by using silicon as a host material for our semiconductor spin qubits. So a lot of this work was spearheaded by Xiaomi. He's a former student who's now at Google and Felix Borians who just graduated and moved to Intel. And then we have a nice collaboration with Jacob Taylor and Guido Burkhardt's group. So the, the past couple of talks have been oriented towards quantum optics and uh, I wanna kind of transition to solid state systems and particular spins and semiconductors, but then I'll add a microwave optical component to it uh, later on. But basically we're motivated to use this system. We can work with a single electron trapped in a semiconductor quantum dot in a large magnetic field so that the spin down and spin up states are split by the Zeeman energy. And if the Zeeman energy exceeds KT, uh, we could basically thermalize the system and initialize the spin in the ground state. And there are also tricks that we can use to read out the spin orientation of a single electron uh, basically, by using a spin-dependent tunneling event and a very sensitive charge detector, we can distinguish between a spin-down or a spin-up state and also distinguish between singlet and triplet states. And then for control of these electron spins, we can use electron spin resonance, just a conventional ESR kind of toolbox to drive single spin rotations. And the two-qubit gate is implemented in this system generally by pushing the electrons together momentarily to increase the wave function overlap. We can turn on an exchange interaction. And that exchange energy can be quite large, you know, leading to two qubit gate times that are shorter than a nanosecond. And one of the reasons for working with spins is that they're naturally well isolated from the environment. The magnetic moment is small. Uh, the spins generally don't couple the charge uh, unless it's through spin orbit coupling, which is weak. And so that gives us very long spin lifetimes and long coherence times T2. And uh, another reason to work with spins instead of superconductors is because we can leverage the conventional semiconductor fabrication technology. So uh, I think a big theme from my group for the past few years has been to develop a range of spin qubit couplers. Uh, spins generally interact via nearest neighbor exchange interaction. And to turn on exchange coupling, we need to push the two electrons together. And that really means that we need control over the positions of these electrons at the nanometer length scale. And uh, since exchange is mediated by wave function overlap, it's by nature a short range interaction. But for a kind of general quantum device, we might not want to be limited to just nearest neighbor interactions. And, you know, the previous talk about the fiber couple is kind of interesting because you can have this long range atom interaction. And so one question is how can we achieve a long range spin spin interaction? Um, so yeah, intermediate length scale approach that we have been pursuing is one in which we just try to physically move the spin down a chain of quantum dots to cover length scales on the micron regime. Uh, I want to focus today on a, what has a potential to be a much longer length scale. And the idea here is to take our single electron spin in these semiconductor quantum devices and try to hybridize that spin degree of freedom uh, with a photonic degree of freedom in the circuit quantum electrodynamics architecture. So just as a, a brief outline of the lecture, and I'll, I'll try to move it along here, so I know it's getting late over there. Let's give a brief overview of the, the cavity QED physics that's relevant for our system. And then I wanna cover some of the device physics about how our structures work and show you how we can embed our semiconductor spin qubit devices in a microwave cavity that has a moderate quality factor, at least high enough to, to see strong coupling physics. And then I'm gonna kind of march through some results from the group. The first demonstration I wanna show you is that we can take a single electron and localize it in this device and coherently couple the charge degree of freedom of that charge to a single microwave frequency photon. And then what we can do is we can add in a, an element of spin orbit coupling. And the spin orbit coupling is sort of artificial. Silicon generally has a weak intrinsic spin orbit coupling. And uh, therefore we, generate spin orbit coupling by using a micromagnet. And the, the micromagnet gives us a spatially dependent Zeeman splitting, think of it that way, that can hybridize the spin with a photonic degree of freedom. And so this is a, a special avoided crossing here, uh, showing a coherent interaction between a single spin and a single microwave frequency photon. 
And we, we've tried to extend this over the past couple of years. This has been really hard uh, to get the numbers to the point where the experiment works reliably. But basically a long-term goal is to be able to couple two spins coherently over a distance of about a centimeter using a microwave frequency photon. And these data here show sort of a first demonstration of one of the first steps toward that kind of interaction where we can simultaneously tune an electron spin here into resonance with a photon and at the same time tune another spin that's at the opposite end of the cavity into resonance with that microwave frequency photon. And what we've observed so far is a resonant enhancement of the vacuum Robbie splitting, which indicates that there's a collective coupling to this cavity mode uh, via the spin orbit coupling. So let's kind of dive into the physics of this system. This is a solid state implementation of an atomic physics experiment where right? we're conventionally in cavity QED. You have a two level atom with some ground state, excited state energy splitting that's matched to the mode of an optical or a microwave frequency cavity. And the two level atom and the photonic fields couple coherently via this interaction rate G, the vacuum Robbie frequency. And we always have to worry about loss in the system. And the two common modes of loss are the photonic decay rate kappa and the qubit dephasing rate gamma. And so the system is nicely described by the James Cummings Hamiltonian. We have a photon energy. The atom can be in the ground state or the excited state. And then there's the interesting interaction term that uh, allows these two systems to coherently transfer an excitation back and forth. So I can have a transition from the excited state of the atom to the ground state that populates the cavity of the single photon. And we can pass that excitation back and forth uh, many times in some systems. Uh, this work, you know, as you're all probably aware, started off in atomic physics early on. And in the 2000s, you know, early 2000, 2003, 2004, there were several breakthroughs both with superconducting circuits and with the photonic crystal crack cavities, for example, or distributed Bragg reflectors, where you could take a, a semiconductor quantum dot that's self-assembled and put in an optical cavity and actually resolve vacuum Robbie splitting in a solid state environment. And, and that really opened the door to doing these kinds of quantum optics experiments uh, in a solid state platform. And so on the, the heels of the uh, Sholkoff and Walruff demonstration of vacuum Robbie splitting with a superconducting qubit, um, the semiconductor community very quickly kind of hopped on that idea. And uh, there are several theoretical proposals, just a, a couple of them are illustrated here, you know, illustrating some ideas for coherently coupling two charged qubits, in this case, semiconductor double dots coupled to a microwave strip line, but basically showing that you could have a coherent interaction at a long distance that's mediated by microwave frequency photons. And the, uh, the trick to extend this to spin is to use a combination of electric dipole coupling and some kind of spin orbit coupling. This proposal by Triff and Loss uses the intrinsic spin orbit coupling of an indium arsenide nanowire, uh, but other proposals are out there for basically achieving the same kind of spin photon interaction uh, with different types of spin orbit coupling. And so this has been a really exciting area of mesoscopic physics. There have been a lot of developments of quantum dot circuit, quantum electrodynamics platforms for looking at coherent light matter interactions. And these are examples from Walrus Group looking at coupling of gallium arsenide quantum dots to microwave frequency photons. Uh, the carbon nanotube devices have been really cleaned up and uh, some beautiful physics has come out of this system looking at uh, interactions between, you know, charge in a carbon nanotube and microwave frequency photons and extensions of that to say condo physics and, and other degrees of freedom. Uh, this is work from a group in Japan uh, showing, you know, coupling again of a gallium arsenide double dot to photons. And there are other systems as well, uh, triple dots, graphene devices, and I'm going to focus today on silicon types of structures and what we can do there. So let me give you an overview of our device architecture and explain how we can build this cavity QED system in the solid state. And uh, generally we're gonna have a artificial atom. In our case, it's gonna be a semiconductor double quantum dot. Now, this is a scanning electron microscope image. You know, it shows you what our device structure looks like. Uh, thinking about the physics, what this system gives us in the laboratory is an experimentally tunable two-level system. And we're just gonna place a, a single electron in this double well potential and the electron can hop back and forth via tunneling. We can adjust this barrier height to tune that tunneling rate 
to a frequency scale that's compatible with the microwave cavity that the double dot's placed in. And then we're gonna couple the charge trapped in this double quantum dot to the electric field of this microwave cavity, just through the electric dipole interaction initially, and, and try to look at charge photon coupling that way. All right, look at the scale here, please. This is a half a micron. And this active part of our device sits way in here um, at one of the anti-nodes of this microwave cavity. The microwave cavity is, is two-dimensional, um, and you can see it has a length scale here. It's about a centimeter across. And uh, we have an input port and an output port, and we can probe the transmission through the microwave cavity as a function of the parameters of our semiconductor quantum device there, okay? In terms of the physics of the, the optical cavity, I mentioned previously, you know, a lot of the earlier work was done in atomic physics with these Fabry-Perot cavities. It was later extended to these distributed Bragg reflector type cavities with self-assembled dots in the middle. And uh, in most circuit QED experiments today, the experiments are performed in the microwave frequency range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, the primary reason for that is just one of convenience that in, in our experiment, we wanna couple the spin of the electron to a microwave frequency photon and the Zeeman splitting of that spin transition is gonna have an energy scale of order say 40, 50 microEV, which puts you in the, the roughly 10 gigahertz range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, therefore our cavity isn't two meters, it's actually two capacitors with a a conductor in between it. And to, to think about the field profile, we work with lambda over two cavities. The lowest mode here is lambda over two. And there's an in-plane electric field. And we're gonna couple this electric field to the charge that's trapped in our semiconductor uh, double quantum dot. Okay. Uh, this is what the actual quantum device looks like. And there was a quite a bit of effort within the group to, to make this work and put it all together. But we are working with an undoped silicon, silicon germanium header structure. Uh, it allows us to couple electrons that are trapped in the silicon quantum well to the microwave field of that cavity. And to uh, achieve confinement in the plane of this quantum well, on top of this header structure stack, we fabricate this set of overlapping metallic gates. And really what we're trying to do with this gate pattern is confine an electron uh, in a zero dimensional box. You know, think of it that way. We're, we're confining the electron on all sides uh, using confinement in the Z direction to this quantum well in the semiconductor conduction band offsets here and confinement in the plane of that quantum well by adjusting the potentials on these electrostatic gates that sit above on top of the device, okay? Uh, this is a complicated structure here. This is actually nine quantum dots in series with some charge detectors. But most of the results I'll discuss today are obtained on much simpler devices where really just think of it as a double up potential and we're gonna put one electron in and look for coupling to the cavity field. Let me first discuss some of the, the charge physics results. And uh, the way to think about this semiconductor double quantum dot is you have two quantum dots in series uh, they're coupled by a tunnel barrier that has some resistance and capacitance. And we can always probe transport through this device by measuring conductance or current through it. Uh, due to the small scale of these quantum dots, there's a large electrostatic charging energy. And that means that we need to change these gate voltages by a significant amount, you know, typically 10 to 40 millivolts to change the electron number on one of these quantum dots. And what's expected just from simple electrostatic model is if you're to measure the number of electrons in the left quantum dot and right quantum dot as a function of these gate voltages, you obtain what's called a charge stability diagram. And the, the pairs of numbers here denote the charge occupancy of the left and right dots. Therefore, you know, zero, zero means no electron in the left dot, no electron in the right dot. And then we can load one electron on the, the right quantum dot by moving over here in this region of the charge stability space. And kind of the first question is, you know, looking at the, this, the differences in length scales, we have this half micron device in a one centimeter wide cavity. Um, is, is there actually any signal that we can obtain from this nanoscale device? And the first measurement we can do is we can just take a coherent probe tone and drive the cavity close to the cavity resonance frequency and measure the microwave transmission through the cavity as a function of these two gate voltages, V left and V right, that adjust the tilt and depth of that double well potential. And you know, remarkably what we see in the cavity transmission, we can 
directly map out the charge stability diagram of the semiconductor double quantum dot. And uh, what we can do is we can zoom in here where this red circle is. Uh, this is a special charge transition. It's called an interdot charge transition. And what we're doing at the interdot charge transition in general is we're taking one excess electron and moving it from the left to the right side of the double up potential or back in the other direction. This is a five electron charge state, three, two. We're starting with three electrons in the left dot, two in the right. And by moving this way across that transition, we can tilt the double up potential and move the single charge back and forth. And what you can see in the data is that there's a really strong cavity response right here uh, in the middle of this, this data set. And that corresponds to kind of the electron flopping back and forth and changing the characteristics of the microwave cavity. So let's try to understand that in more detail. I'm kind of zooming in now on a, a localized region of this larger charge stability diagram in the vicinity of an interdot charge transition. And there are charge transitions that change the total electron number. For example, I can add one electron to the left dot and move from the zero zero to the one zero charge state. And there are these interdot charge transitions that conserve the total electron number, but just redistribute where the charge is at within the device. And uh, just for simplicity, I'm gonna focus uh, exclusively on this interdot charge transition where we're coupling two discrete levels and we're not coupling to a continuum like we would at a, a transition with the leads, okay? What's nice about these interdot charge transitions is really concretely described, and this has been proved many times experimentally by just a simple two-level Hamiltonian. Uh, we have a energy level associated with the left quantum dot, an energy level associated with the right quantum dot. And by adjusting the voltages on our device, we can tune the level detuning. We call that epsilon. And by adjusting the barrier that separates the left and right sides of the double up potential, we can also experimentally tune the tunnel coupling, which is called TC here in this Hamiltonian. And so this is basically the bonding, anti-bonding energy difference of our artificial molecule. And this is gate voltage tunable. And it's very convenient that we can tune this energy splitting to be close to the microwave photon energy and look for interactions there. Uh, in terms of the physics, this is just the Hamiltonian of that, effectively it's a charged qubit. You have some sigma Z term, and then there's hybridization of the levels through the sigma X term. The way the cavity field enters in, physically I like to think of it as electric field on that microwave cavity. It's coupling to the charge in the quantum dot, and you can think of it as just shaking the energy levels around at the resonant frequency of the cavity. So what that does then is it uh, modulates the detuning of our system at the frequency uh, that the cavity is being probed at. And so there's this coupling term here. Um, and then we can just uh, massage these equations a little bit, move into the energy eigenbasis uh, to derive this total Hamiltonian. Uh, we can then transform to a rotating frame and just quantize the electromagnetic field. And what drops out of this is the conventional James Cummings Hamiltonian, right? Where we have the photon energy, the energy of our qubit, and then an interaction term. What's distinct about this interaction term is that there's a, a bare coupling G naught that's modified by what I call a mixing angle. But you can think of it this way, if the double well is strongly tilted, the electron's gonna be localized in one side and it, it can't move in a tightly confined quantum dot. And if we tilt it the other way, the electron's over here, tightly confined, it doesn't really act, interact with the cavity field. But if we sit right at the zero detuning where the left quantum dot energy level is matched to the right quantum dot energy level, that very small cavity electric field can cause the electron to basically flop back and forth in that double dot system. And that uh, gives us a, a large interaction strength and explains why in the data we see a signal at this, this line here near what's called zero detuning, uh, where this is a maximal coupling. The next is to, to try to calculate, to predict what the cavity response is gonna look like as a function of the external parameters, for example, the quantum dot detuning, the tunnel coupling. And uh, we can just use standard input output theory, uh, work through that to derive these conventional expressions, input output theory expressions for the microwave transmission through the cavity, as well as the phase response of the cavity. Okay, so in experiment, we're gonna shine a microwave tone into the left side of the cavity. We're gonna measure the transmission through the right side of the cavity. 
and then fit that using a standard input output theory. Um, and I think, you know, still quite striking to look at these older data, but uh, in conventional DC transport measurements, you're usually limited by KT, you know, thermal energy, which makes it hard to extract things with high precision. Uh, but in contrast, in these circuit QED systems, we're using a really well-defined microwave mode to probe our charge qubit or spin qubit. And we can apply this input output theory. And you can see here, you know, we can precisely fit the cavity transmission as a function of the level detuning and extract the charge photon coupling strength. And so this is the coherent coupling rate between a charge in our device and a microwave frequency photon. Now what I'm gonna do is compare that number that was about seven megahertz, that coherent coupling rate to the undesirable loss rates in the system. Our microwave cavities aren't perfect. They're pretty complex compared to a superconducting qubit system because we have a lot of wires running in to control the quantum dot potential. Uh, so we have a cavity decay rate. In this case, it's measured to be about a megahertz. That's less than the coherent coupling rate. Um, that's good. And the nice surprise in these measurements is we can probe the bonding, anti-bonding energy difference, basically the charge qubit transition energy as a function of detuning uh, that has the expected parabolic dependence here. And by extracting the line width, we can determine what the dephasing rate of this charge qubit is. And we found a dephasing rate on the order of five megahertz. Uh, therefore, both the charge dephasing rate and the cavity loss rate are less than the coherent coupling rate. And that means that we have a chance in this device to actually see a strong coupling signature. And then what's plotted here is the cavity transmission as a function of the frequency of the microwave field that's probing the cavity and the double quantum dot energy level detuning. And uh, basically in the absence of the charge qubit, this would just be a, a strong feature at the resonance frequency of the cavity where we can populate it with photons. But you see, as we adjust the detuning of our double quantum dot system, we can bring the charge qubit transition energy closer to the energy of the cavity photon and uh, tune those into resonance with each other. And we observe a vacuum Rappi splitting, uh, which is indicative of a coherent coupling between the charge and that double dot in the microwave frequency photon. Uh, here's another data set I really like because with your naked eye, you can see the parabolic dispersion relationship of the charge qubit there, you know, sweeping through the cavity frequency. And again, this is a coherent coupling of, of charge in a photon in a microwave cavity. And this has been extended to, to quite a few different systems now, both you know, other semiconductor systems as well as kind of hybrid systems that combine a transmon qubit and a charge qubit. What about spin? What's the next step for spin? Uh, coupling to spin is really difficult to do conventionally. You know, what you would think of doing is let's try to couple the magnetic moment to a magnetic field of one of these microwave cavities. And uh, generally the magnitude of the magnetic field is gonna be on the order of a nanotesla or so. And if you just take that and calculate the precession rate in that 10 nanotesla field, you find that the coherent interaction rate between the spin and the magnetic moment of that electron is only about 10 Hertz, which is much, much slower than the, you know, it's basically, it's much slower than the dephasing time. So you, you can't see anything here that's, a, that's, that's coherent. And so some groups have tried to work around this by working at large spin ensembles. You can take a sample of diamond, for example, that contains you know, a billion or more nitrogen vacancy centers and use the root N enhancement of the coupling rate to achieve a collective coupling to a cavity mode. And these are some of the early references and this has been reproduced in many other systems now. But what we wanna do is let's try to target a single spin. And the, the trick here is First, we're gonna work with silicon because it offers a very long spin coherence time and a spin lifetime. And then we're gonna use an indirect coupling mechanism that's actually stronger than the direct magnetic coupling mechanism. We're gonna use the electric dipole coupling that I just described in the charge experiment. And we're gonna combine that with the spin orbit coupling that's generated by some little nanomagnets that are fabricated on top of the device. And we're gonna set our double well potential right in the fringing field of these micromagnets. And the way I think about this is if we move the electron back and forth, the local quantization axis of the spin is actually, it's canting a little bit as the charge moves back and forth. And you can picture that as something, a couple spin to position. It's like a spin orbit interaction. Uh, let's think about the physics then of, of what's happening in the device. This is our 
conventional charge qubit Hamiltonian and uh, we're at zero magnetic field. So the electron's either on the left or on the right, or it's hybridized in some molecular bonding and anti-bonding states at zero detuning. Now, if we turn on magnetic field, what happens? Well, now if the Zeeman splitting of the electron spin is appreciable, we're gonna have two copies of this energy level diagram, one for the spin down state of the electron and one for the spin up state of the electron. And that effectively gives us two copies of this charge qubit. Uh, kind of picture. Uh, the final step is to introduce in the Hamiltonian an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And that's the magnetic field gradient that's generated by these micromagnets. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, the field gradient here is just huge. It's on the order of a Tesla per micron. It's really a fantastically large magnetic field gradient. And so, you know, even when you're moving the electron by a few nanometers, the electron experiences that field gradient. And there's actually a difference in the Zeeman splitting between the left site and the right site. And uh, what this transverse magnetic field gradient does is it uh, gives an additional hybridization in our system that allows us to sort of move the electron from the left dot to the right dot and flip the spin at the same time. That's the picture. Um, so what the device looks like, it's very similar to the previous structure. Only real differences here is where it's a slightly different microwave cavity. It has a higher impedance that increases the charge photon coupling strength. And then you can see from this pictorial depiction of our device here, we have our gate electrodes that are creating this double L confinement potential. Again, we're just going to populate this with one electron, but now we have some micromagnets on top of the chip. And the micromagnets generate this magnetic field gradient, right, that leads to this spin orbit coupling. So now what we can do is we can measure the cavity transmission as a function of the frequency of the microwave field that's probing the cavity and the external magnetic field. And uh, let's look at the right panel here. What we're doing is we're increasing the magnetic field. That's increasing the Zeeman splitting of the single electron spin state. And you can see in the data here that when the Zeeman splitting is matched to the cavity frequency, uh, there's a void of crossing. And this is a indicative of a coherent hybridization of the single electron spin that's trapped in that quantum dot and the microwave photon that's occupying the cavity. Uh, these devices contain two double quantum dots. There's one here and one over here on the left-hand side. Uh, the inset shows the vacuum Robbie splitting for the other double dot in the system. And so you can see that in both of these devices, we can coherently couple the single electron spin to a single photon. And here are the rough kind of figures of Mare. We obtained coherent spin photon coupling rates that are on the order of 5 megahertz. We have a spin decoherence rate. Uh, this should be gamma S over 2 pi. That's of order a couple megahertz. And our cavity decay rates on the order of a megahertz or so. And that yields a cooperativity of about 7. Um, what's convenient about this system is that the double quantum dot, you know, just from that avoided level crossing picture gives us a tunable electric dipole moment. By tilting the double L potential, we can quickly localize the charge and effectively freeze out that dipole moment. And that means that by adjusting the level detuning, we can tune the spin photon coupling strength. Here it's maximal at zero detuning where the left and right dot energy levels are tuned into resonance with each other. But if we just slightly detune the system, in this case, there's only 40 micro EV of detuning you can see here that the avoided crossing gets smaller and here it's basically imperceptible. It's a tiny effect on the cavity transmission. And uh, this is useful in the long run because it means that by adjusting the detuning of our spin qubits, we can tune them in and out of resonance with the cavity in, in a time domain fashion. And uh, the next slide kind of rolls all that together, showing you that if we operate in so-called dispersive regime where the Zeeman energy of the spin is detuned from the cavity, uh, we can use the cavity as a probe of the electron spin state through this dispersive Hamiltonian. And what this Hamiltonian says here is that basically the photon energy, h bar omega, is conditioned on the orientation of that electron spin. And the amount of shift in the cavity response goes like g squared over detuning. It's kind of conventional g squared over delta dependence. And by controlling the electron spin and then reading it out through the cavity, we can use this circuit QED platform to resolve 
single spin Rabi oscillations and read this out in this dispersive limit of circuit QED. Okay, what about the next steps? We have strong charge photon coupling, strong spin photon coupling. Now the question is, can we actually achieve a long distance spin-spin interaction that's mediated by a microwave frequency photon? And it sounds like a, a simple extension of the previous experiment, but there are a number of things that, that we had to overcome. And I'll just uh, mention one of the issues here briefly is that, you know, remember we have these micromagnets on top of our device. Uh, they generate a field gradient. Uh, this yes. Uh, sorry, I just had one question. Maybe I missed it. In the sure. first case, uh, in the strong charge photon coupling, what was the cooperativity? I didn't mention it explicitly there. I'd say it varies between 10 and 20 for the charge photon coupling Thank strength. You. And yeah. for the spin photon, it is around seven, is it? Okay. okay. It's around seven. And I think there's some recent Delft results that push that a little bit higher. They work with the high impedance cavity and they might be up to 10 or 14 now. Okay. 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 Thank you. I'll come on as at the end, like what the limitations are. There's some hard problems that we, we have to overcome, I think, to, to make that a hundred or so. It's, it's okay. a pretty big effort. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, I was mentioning again, we have these micromagnets on the chip that generate a huge magnetic field gradient. And, and what that means is, is any positioning and accuracy of those micromagnets, it means that the Zaman splitting on the left side of the device can be different than the Zaman splitting on the right side of the device. So tuning the photon and the left spin and the right spin simultaneously into resonance with the cavity is, is actually kind of hard. And the, the way that we, we got around this is we can take our micromagnets and actually rotate them relative to the axis of the double quantum dot. And we do this in an equal and opposite kind of sense. And, and the way I think of this is, I think of the pole faces of an electromagnet, they direct the field lines, right? From one pole face to another. So if we rotate the direction of the external magnetic field, we can use these micromagnets to kind of amplify the uh, total effective field that the electron spin experiences. And uh, this is data here now where we have an electron over here in the left double dot, electron over here in the right double dot. We see avoided crossings associated with the left spin and the right spin, but you can see that they're occurring at different magnetic fields. What we wanna do is coalesce all three systems, the spin in the left dot, the spin in the right dot, and the photon, the cavity, and have a simultaneous resonance condition. And we're gonna achieve that by rotating the magnetic field relative to the, the device. And so here's a condition now where you can see at an angle of about 5.6 degrees, the left spin and the right spin are simultaneously in resonance with the cavity. And uh, there we see an enhancement in the vacuum Rabi splitting that's consistent with the factor of root two enhancement you would expect from the James Cummings Hamiltonian. Uh, these data from earlier last year then show that we can achieve a collective coupling to this cavity mode in a situation where everything's uh, simultaneously in resonance. Uh, these are data from two devices. You can see the spin photon coupling for the left spin and the right spin. And then the green curve is when we tune both spins into resonance simultaneously with the cavity. Uh, here there's an enhancement in the vacuum Rabi splitting. We expect a root two enhancement because we have two spins now coupled to the cavity mode. And that the data are, are nicely consistent with that theoretical expectation. Uh, here's another device, 12 megahertz coupling for the right spin, 13 megahertz for the left spin. When we tune both spins in a resonance simultaneously, we see that root two enhancement. Okay. So that indicates that through this photonic interconnect, we have coupling between the left spin and the right spin. All right, what's next from here? Uh, this is a, a demonstration of resonant spin-spin coupling. But ideally what we'd like to do is achieve a off resonant or a dispersive coupling. Uh, because if we lose, lose a photon into the cavity mode, right, that, that's basically an error. And that's uh, by the rate kappa. Uh, so off resonant desiring is, is, you know, off resonant coupling is generally desirable, but it's hard to get there. And, and one is that, you know, you see the cooperativity number we have is around seven or so. We need to improve the spin photon coupling rate relative to the cavity decay rate. And we need to improve the spin photon coupling rate relative to the qubit decay rate to really convert this uh, platform into a technology where we could conventionally you know, achieve a high fidelity gate between two spins in a time domain. And uh, the approaches that we're taking, and this is a 
pretty technical project. We're trying to boost the spin photon coupling strength by using high impedance microwave cavities. The other thing that's really limiting our devices is that our cavity quality factors, if you notice, are, they're rather modest. They're on the order of 3,000, 10,000. Whereas for a standard superconducting implementation of circuit QED, you might have 100,000 or in best cases, one or 2 million. And we're pretty far off the mark there. And part of that is just due to the fact that our devices are different. We have a lot of DC gate lines that lead into the cavity that provide microwave leakage pass. Another thing that's different is it's a much more complex material system. We're not working with aluminum or niobium on sapphire. We have a silicon, silicon germanium header structure. It has a lot of layers and interfaces. Uh, there are gates on top of that. And one of the things that we're trying to do now is separate out the cavity from the semiconductor spin qubit and build a, basically a three-dimensional kind of circuit in a flip chick architecture that will result in a much higher cavity quality factor and reduce this kappa significantly. So stay, stay tuned for that. I think there will be some nice results out from this uh, later this year. So just to conclude, uh, in this quantum dot circuit quantum electric dynamics system, we've been able to achieve a coherent charge photon interactions, coherent spin photon interactions, and then most recently, the, the first kind of glimmer of a long range spin spin coupling that's mediated by a microwave frequency photon. And just want to thank the people that did the work. This is Dave Zajac, Xiaomi, uh, former students in the group. Felix Borion's just left and moved to Intel, has a permanent position there. Uh, Michael Gollon's been helping out a lot with theory. And Xanthi Crute uh, provided some support in the early phases of the spin spin demonstration. Thanks again for having me on us, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, so yeah, uh, are there any questions? Hi, yes, I have a question. Sure, sure, go ahead, go ahead. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, actually, I have a question. So uh, if I understand correctly, um, if you look at the um, data for uh, the up resonant case, uh, so which corresponds to another magnetic field tuning, uh, essentially, you see a crossing between the two lines or uh, uh, the, the left spin and the right spin line? Or, uh, like... I think the question, Takis, is if I, if I tune both of the spins, let's say above the cavity, Absolutely, do yeah. I see a dispersive avoid crossing there? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. We've looked hard for it in these devices. It's, it's rather, rather minor. It's difficult to see because the kappa is so large and the spin dephasing rates are so large. The, the Delft group presented some kind of preliminary results at APS where they can resolve it directly in two-tone spectroscopy. They really see the avoided crossing. Uh, but I would say, you know, kind of based on my look at it, it's still pretty far off of like the Hannes Meyer Sholkoff results. Uh, you know, where the, the first demonstration of dispersive coupling for two transmons is really clear. I think there's a lot of work to do to still, you know, improve the kappa. Uh, it's kind of surprising in their experiment, they have a charge photon interaction that's two or 300 megahertz. But I would say that the resulting spin photon coupling that they achieve is moderately increased relatively. And so I, I think with another factor of, of two or so improvement, in kappa or gamma takis that we'd be able to resolve the dispersive avoid crossing in our experiment. So far, it's been a struggle. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, uh, is it possible to tune this setup into the ultra strong regime, ultra strong coupling regime? Uh, this uh, uh, coupling to the uh, uh, photon mode? It depends on what kind of mode of interaction you're, you're looking at here. I think that with charged photon interactions, the superconducting community is kind of pushed into the, the ultra strong coupling regime. It's a bit more difficult with our devices. And, and one reason is just the length scale is that the, so the superconducting transmon qubits that are used in the superconducting community, you know, they're, they're like big antennas. They're a few hundred microns across, right? And that generally gives a, a, a nice coupling to the cavity electric field. Whereas in our device, we're trying to push a single charge across, you know, the interdot distance that's hundred nanometers. So it's difficult for us to have as large of a charge photon coupling rate that's achieved in the superconducting devices. And uh, we're not quite there yet. 
in terms of having a G that's comparable to cavity frequency. I think the, the best result that I mentioned in response to Takas's question is the, the Delft group is using high impedance microwave cavities, which effectively a boost the vacuum fluctuations, of the cavity field, and uh, that can give uh, Gs that are order 300 megahertz, 200 megahertz, kind of in that range, but that's still pretty far away from the five or 10 gigahertz cavity frequency. Okay, thank you. And uh, what is the typical uh, decay rate of the charges from these double quantum noise? They, they sort of leak into this uh, uh, reservoir sites, right? Like what is the typical time scale? Yeah, uh, let me go back to a device image for you and then just comment on that. Yeah, this is the, the semiconductor double quantum dot, right? That, that the device is coupled to. Um, the charge is, is basically living in there, right? And so there's a charge lifetime and a charge dephasing time. And generally, you know, charge qubits are quite difficult to work with because the charge dephasing times can be, can be very short. Uh, we found that in the silicon system, if we focus on keeping the interfaces clean, uh, we can achieve charge transmission line lists that are five or so megahertz, uh, okay, um, for the charge degree of freedom. And one of the reasons to work with spin is because that further insulates you from the deleterious effects of, of charge noise. Uh, so, so those are basically the time scales. I, I have to add to that, that this is strongly device and system dependent. Our early experiments in the circuit QED architecture, we tried to do this experiment with the indium arsenide nanowire. And you know, think of the nanowire, this is a really large surface to volume ratio. Whereas in these newer devices, we're working in a quantum well where the electrons are isolated from the surface by about a 50 nanometer layer of silicon germanium. And that mm -hmm. reduces the susceptibility to charge noise at the surface. And so I'd say that uh, we generically see spin photon coupling that's strong in all of our devices, uh, but achieving strong charge photon coupling is, is much harder generally. We don't see it in all devices because the charge noise varies from sample to sample. Yeah. Okay. Thank I hope that you, addresses your question. No, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, any any other questions? Can I have one more question actually? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so so uh, uh, instead of like uh, treating this charge loss as a like uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, negativity of this thing, uh, is it is is it possible to like uh, uh, you know uh, also measure these charge currents and sort of like uh, uh, develop some uh, new technology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that you know we can do, right? We can use this cavity QED system and the dispersive limit to probe spin dynamics, but you can also use the sensitivity of the system to probe charge noise. And uh, we have a paper on that where we use a measurement of the cavity transmission as a function of time to try to extract what the actual you know spectrum of the charge noise in the device looks like and to back out an amplitude of the one over F noise. And, and I think that there's quite a bit of room for using these microwave cavities for spectroscopy, you know, in general of condensed matter systems. This is one example with silicon and silicon germanium, uh, but I think there are a lot of other opportunities as well. Uh, there's been some work to look at 2D materials recently. These microwave cavities, you know, you can proximatize the graphene and make a voltage tunable Josephson junction. And so there's some interesting, you know, different uh, sorts of flavors of devices where you, you have, um, you know, various elements, semiconductor or hybridized superconductor, semiconductor that can modify the properties of the cavity and give you a photonic response. Um, since you brought it up, uh, one of the directions that we're pursuing right now is we're, we're making a, a microscope in the lab that operates at millikelvin temperatures. And the idea is to have a superconducting cavity that's high Q and evanescently uh, couple the field to a solid state device, right? So that we would have a scanning pro version of this cavity QED implementation. And uh, you can also uh, comp uh, like uh, measure the uh, cross correlations between the two circuits, which are here, like uh, double quantum dot circuit two and double quantum dot circuit one. Uh, so yeah, those in, kind in theory, yeah, we should be able to do that. That's not something that we've explored yet. Though. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for questions. Any uh, any other questions? Okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank uh, Jason for the very nice talk.